Thank you everyone for joining okay. us today. My name is Dara Hoffman. I am the primary investigator for CIRCLE, the cross-campus interdisciplinary responsible computing learning experience. Say that three times fast. And we're so delighted today to have Mina Seminole, um, language preservationist and cultural researcher for Chief Dullknife College and Adrian Violette, the Library Director for Chief Del Knife's College, joining us all the way from Lame Deer, Montana today to talk to us about how to not know. Um, I'm really excited about this talk. Sometimes we have super high-tech folks talking about AI. Uh, these lovely ladies are going to talk to us about their experiences as non-tech people using cutting-edge technologies to help preserve language and culture um, through many different cycles of technology. And so thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join us. Um, and I will now mute myself and hand the mic over metaphorically to you guys. To us, to, to the college? Yes. To oh. you and Adrian, yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, I'm Mina Seminole and I um work here for Chief Don Life College in the cultural department. And actually my my position is cultural coordinator. I never knew what my position was. They just threw me in there one day and I've been there for a long time now. <laughs> but anyway, it's uh it's kind of um not knowing what we're gonna talk about, I guess. <laughs> so we what well, I was, uh, well, Adrian and I talked about, um, especially with all the things that the, the cultural center and TIPO had done over the years. Um, I was really amazed when I went down there. You know, you can see almost every generation of new technology that you guys have adopted over time to, to preserve language and culture. You know, you got CD and before that you've got cassette tapes and you can tell that there's been a lot of really early adoption. Uh, by folks who one people wouldn't necessarily describe as tech folks. So, and there's Adrian. Hi, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Adrian, I was just kind of introducing you to our attendees, and if you're ready, I'm going to hand it over to you, ladies. Now, okay. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, we're coming to you from um, Lame Deer, Montana. Um, where I'm in a library setting and Mina is in the cultural center setting and we're both on Chief Dullknife College campus. So our work aligns in a lot of ways and um, we're finding more ways to work together, I think. So yes, um, Mina, do you want to share a little bit about the cultural center? Okay. In the cultural center, we have um, us. This year, just, just just recently, we hired our, our linguist because one of the main things that we're trying to preserve is our language. We have over 12,000 enrolled Northern Cheyenne people, but of the 12,000, there's less than 300 that are first language speakers, such as I am, where Cheyenne was my first language. So it's really a big concern, kind of like a really critical right now where we need to bring in our youth to, um, you know, to give them what we have, what we have in our heads, you know, to for them to continue. Um, so that's one number one thing that we have. And so with our linguist, we we work closely with her and she's teaching right now, teaching the language to the youth. And they seem to uh, really be accepting her because she makes it really fun. And today we were talking about, um, we're gonna bring some uh, interns on for the summer uh, youth. And um, we have a camp. And so she wants to do some, uh, games and things like on on um, the computer so they can, you know, how the youth now relate to all this technology, to the um, um, TikTok and all these other. <laughs> so that's what she wants to do. So I think that's where we're, we will be relying on that to, to help with the teaching, especially our younger, younger people that are interested in the language and the culture. So, and then in, in our office, we have two of the other ladies that uh, we, uh, that are first language speakers, and they're just really devoted to the language and the culture. And so we're, and also too, um, they're learning how to write our, lang our uh, language. So 
that's really a learning process for all of us because we don't have very many people that know how to write the language. We speak the language, but we don't know how to write it. And 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 so that's a real challenge there. And and we just get involved in a lot of things. Sometimes people come in and they want to know their what their um, Cheyenne name is. And so we kind of keep track of that too. And a lot of our, our people, they don't know how to write their Cheyenne name. And so we we write it out for them and and it's on the computer. We have um, um, most of the uh, dictionary on the online now. So that's a real a real plus for us as a tribe because now we can go to we always tell people, well look it up on the computer. <laughs> what do you do when you're in you know, you know, like when you're researching papers and for school and then you, you look up stuff on the dictionary. So we're trying to encourage them to learn how to do that. And so let's see what else do we do. This for the summer we're having um the language camp for our youth and and let's see what else do we do. And we just get involved in so many different things, you know, and it's really been great working with um the library because we re- rely on her to keep track of all our stuff. <laughs> and that's where we have different knowledge sets and different skill sets, and we have to continually integrate them. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that I've had to learn in the past few years being here, we are working on a project called Seeking Immortality. And the Seeking Immortality project is to build a virtual reality space where people can engage with culture. And I come to this not knowing a lot about the culture and not knowing a lot about virtual reality or computers in general. So I've had to find a way to be able to communicate um, interdepartmentally, um, both with IT and with the cultural center. How do we ensure that, um, let's say that our metadata reflects uh, Cheyenne ways of knowing. Um, How do I communicate that I need a server thingy (laughs) to hold all this stuff? And I don't know how much stuff, so please don't ask me specifically. And um, I found that like going to IT is, um, it's incredibly a vulnerable moment because um, I don't feel smart when I go in there. And I don't feel smart when I don't know what I'm asking for, but I've had to kind of uh, step into those moments of unsureness and um, be brave <laughs> and and just say, I, I don't know. Um, one thing that's helped tremendously is recognizing that um, much like w- we speak about the Cheyenne language and um the preservation of the Cheyenne language. Like I'm also speaking another language when I go to it that we don't speak the same language. I'm using my hands to explain what I need or what I would like to see happen. And I'm hoping that that's interpreted um, when I'm there. Um, And it's hard. It's hard to show up and not know what you're talking about. Um, but I've also found um, in my coursework, one one course, and I can't even remember what the course was, but the assignment was to um, communicate to IT. <laughs> and what I found in that assignment was that, um, and, and through the readings was that um, I'm, I'm an advocate for my department. I don't have to speak, uh, I don't have to be fluent in digital technology in order to communicate what my needs are for the library, just as Mina doesn't have to be fluent in technology to communicate what the needs are for language preservation. Um, So really we're advocating for our fields by stepping into those spaces where we're vulnerable and asking to just be a part of conversations. And also I found too, like IT doesn't know what I mean, either when I'm talking in library terms, right? So it's not, it's finding that common language so that we can share each other's needs and concerns and move our 
departments forward and our institution forward, really. Um, so, so go ahead, Mina. Oh, I was just going to say, in, in our office, we have a lot of resources, resource material. So that's also where we get a lot of calls from, like even from the school sometimes, the teachers, they want to know what event. And so we... So we have to kind of keep up with what what we have. And so that one of the things that we had said that we would do this year is we would uh, make an inventory of what we have. And so that's a process that's ongoing now. And, um, and then the other thing is um, always working with encouraging, you know, like our youth. And, oh, we have another program called Class 7 where we, we um, train... Um, the language instructors that actually teach in the in the public schools. And so we're always looking for training for them so they can be more effective with their, you know, what they have to do. So that's on another. Uh, so we're just like busy all the time and we're looking for training for them where they can earn their CEUs, you know, continuing education units. And so and then getting them ready to go. And it's it's just a, an everyday, it's like we're doing something new every day. Mm-hmm. Every day is just, just, it's never a dull moment in our office. And then we have people that sometimes just drop in and they have information that maybe we would like to have them share. So we ask to record them. So we're doing a lot of the recording and also uh, Adrian's doing that too. So between our departments, you know, we, well, piece together <laughs> our world, our Cheyenne world, I guess, and we're leaving it for, you know, for people that will come later. So it's always with that thought in mind, well, what do I have to share? I need to put this in, you know, and in, in preserve it. So maybe... When we're all gone, all the first language speakers, then they'll have something to fall on. What did we do? How did we do naming ceremonies? How did we, um, just a lot of stuff. Even that, you know, the kids, sometimes they don't know what, for instance, uh, some a youth asked me one time, what is a callback ceremony? Because it was on a poster that the Northern Cheyenne tribe hosts a, um, um, a powwow, a big powwow in July every year. So prior to the start of that powwow, they have a callback ceremony. And this I was a high school student. He said, what do they mean by that? What's a callback ceremony? What do I do? And and it's a time where we call people that have lost, you know, loved ones during the year. We ask them to come back. And, you know, they've been in mourning, grieving for their loved one and so we asked them to come back into the circle of you know the activities the social aspects so with you know not letting go of their grief completely but you know they're always going to remember their loved one but it's it's a ceremony that the tribe does so you know bringing back the people that have lost people and so little stuff like that we're just always called upon to to tell them how do you do this or how do you do that <laughs> <laughs> or what is this for? So we have to know, or if we don't know, we have to find out. One of the things we've run into too with all of the recordings is that there was different um, uh, naming conventions for the files. There's different places where they're kept. They're on CDs, cassettes, reel-to-reels, Um And like, we'll talk about like, oh, we should, you know, we should record that or we should include, um, let's say the Buffalo jump in our virtual reality space. And who do we record to do that? And then it always comes up like, well, I think so-and-so did that. And we don't have um, the inventories in place that we need to go and find those things and pull them up when we need them in that moment. And so that's one of the things that I've recognized that I can contribute is some kind of structure or organization that will um, allow for accessibility in the moment. <laughs> I, They're on a shelf somewhere. <laughs> They're in a box somewhere. Well, we've talked about that too in our office where we could just like, maybe it's on the computer, we could show them, this is where it is, you know, where you go to look for certain things and, you know, so... 
we're right in the same boat there. <laughs> the other thing I've noticed too, as far as language preservation um, and the, um, I would say like the generational or decades um, approaches to engaging with um, language um, in, in the archives, like we have a number of typewritten or printed out things. And then there's this that goes to like kind of the mid nineties. And then there's this gap where it's not that the conversations about language preservation stopped. And it's not that the efforts into the research or the documentation stopped. It's that they were about mid nineties started being held on, um, DVDs and CDs and discs and uh, varying different um, little tiny VHSs and big VHSs. Um, again, you're saying that I don't know <laughs> what these things are, but um, the, that, so, so that knowledge is held in that um, kind of uh, technical bridge time. And if we don't do the work to get that material accessible and on the same format as um, what we're doing now and what was done previously, there's going to be a whole chapter of the conversation that isn't available. We're going to, we're going to miss it. We're going to lose it. We're going to, so I see that there's a place there where, um, and, and I don't know how I'm learning how as I go to, um, to document and digitize these things and get them, like I said, to that same place where we can interact with them kind of in, in a similar format, instead of reinventing the wheel every time we find something that mm -hmm. we want to access. That's true. We're always, we're always looking, we're always finding something that we're missing. How, how do we, you know, how do we protect this? So it's, it's a challenge. And my hope with seeking immortality in this virtual space is that um, there's a, a number of Cheyennes that have moved away from the reservation for economic purposes, educational, social, whatever reason there is for them leaving, there still is a desire among those people to be engaged with their culture. So how can we digitize and make available intangible pieces of culture, stuff that like right. the landscape has come up, um, songs have come up. How do you create a place that's engaging and becomes a part of the workflow of the library, maybe? That's kind of how I would like this um, virtual space to exist down the road is that as we're migrating formats and moving things forward, we're also making them accessible in that engaging environment and interactive environment so that it's not just like the books on the shelves or the files in the folder. It is something that can actually be participated with. Right. Yeah, because we have a lot of material and that, that would, we talked about it one time. I said, I wish somebody would just come in here and help us to be able to, you know, to complete our inventory. What do we have here and how can it be, you know, you know, how can we share this? Because there's, it's such a rich history that the Northern Cheyenne have and we were so proud of it. We want people to learn about us. And, but when we, you know, we have these stacks sitting there, these, volumes we it's like oh god what how do i how do i you know get this out there to the people right um so there's a question in the in the chat from Penn Weldon. Are you connected to any other organizations for technical assistance, especially within Cheyenne communities? Um, the Seeking Immortality Project is a partnership with San Jose State um, and the libraries there. And that's how I got to meet Dara. <laughs> and Dara has helped me immensely with creating just what we're talking about, um, a, a searchable um, interactive place that see in here, I don't know the right word. Is it a dam? Is it a, is it a digital asset management system? Is it a 
content magic. I'm not sure, but we're working with, um, we've selected Preservica to interact or to upload those things to and to serve as our um, searchable interface. And I, uh, I come from the library field, right? So I'm like, I kind of know what mark records are. I know what a library catalog is. Um, I kind of know what happens on the back end, and I know that there's a user interface. So um, Dara has been helping me translate again back to the languages that we speak, right? Translate the um, the library terminology that I'm familiar with and make it to utilize to get me to a place of understanding for um, archival terminology, and that's been interesting and really fun. <laughs> yeah. um other organizations mina who have you guys partnered with to do some of these um more techie things that we engage with well mostly just our it people here that we we work with and um you know we have um sarah who who is with uh, cornell university you know, she helps us a lot too, especially like with funding purposes and where we can go for information, uh, research and things like that. So I guess it would be Cornell University. And then we also, you know, we work with like Montana State University and just whoever we can get to help us. I guess we're not so much into, into um, I guess what we're doing is... Um, you know, for the long longest time, the Cheyenne didn't have their own. You know, didn't write their own history. It was all all uh, put together by non non Indians. And now we're having more and more people that are coming together and writing. You know, writing their own books or in their own. Um, so we're just still, I guess, in the gathering phase. I guess I would say. Plus, still trying to step into this new world of technology, and some and of I would people- add to that, Mina, that we're we're at a point too where we can engage with the digital content in a way that reflects Cheyenne protocols. Mm-hmm. Like because it hasn't been digitized and it isn't set up right. in these formats, we're mm-hmm. able to invite in community members to right. um, help us develop. Uh, subject headings, search terms. Um, and it's not, my example is always that, you know, if you're looking for Cheyenne pictures, mm-hmm. you're looking for, traditionally you would look for the um, photographer. Mm-hmm. And that holds that um, really important Cheyenne history through mm-hmm. a Western lens. So how now as we're migrating into this mm-hmm. these digital platforms, how can we put um, a, a Cheyenne lens over this information, um, both for Cheyenne people to, um, engage with, but also for outsiders to recognize that the the knowledge and the content that we have here is really, really important and really significant. And it's it's not based around the photographers that came in. It's based right. around the individuals that make up the tribe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just like that um, when we did with um, BLM, Bureau of Land Management, and that was a whole process that took about like almost 10 years we weren't so much involved with it at the start, but it was, um, but the college was involved in it. And um, they had people that came in to, um, um, that they interviewed, and then they needed someone to put this on, you know, um, it was uh, Alicia, remember that one lady from, she she developed the software. And so all this information got um, recorded there, the 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 uses of the plants, how they were used for medicinal or ceremonial, and just you know knowledge that we should keep because it's important how the our people back in the day how they would rely on certain plants for food, you know, uh, berries, you know, how you process certain you know foods and. It's things like that. And all that went on um, at this um, program. It's called uh, Regional Echo. Oh, gosh, I can't remember. It's a long, long term. Uh, but it, it's uh, it's going to be online for 
you know, people to go go in and to find information about certain plants. So it's been a process, a whole process that we're learning, and it's it's just a lot. Um, there's a question in the chat. How is CDKC, that's our college, helping mm -hmm. develop? Um, young people or people who can speak Cheyenne libraries and tech. I don't we have know. A we have a challenge. <laughs> oh my gosh! We're just gonna we're aiming high, and eventually we'll we'll climb up. <laughs> we'll climb up and reach that. Take well, a and while. that's just part of it too. Is that it, it's there's so much work to be done and. Um, you talk about funding resources. I think what we run into, even when funding resources are available, is we run into human resources shortages. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that there's not a willingness, but there's not the skill sets within the community right. to take on this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, And it's not about intelligence in any way. It is merely just that there is so much work to be done in the community and not just the library field, not yeah. just cultural centers. There's um, there's an entire nation operating here on the Northern Cheyenne Nation that needs people. And a lot of those positions are filled. So we function wearing a lot of hats, a right. lot of hats. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, how did you develop how did you each develop the willingness to face the vulnerability and discomfort as advocates in the tech space as non-tech people? Mina, do you identify as a non-tech person? Hey, I am a very very non-tech. I get I get nervous when I have to for instance, I have to be doing a, a grant and it's it's really um um scary at first because I don't know exactly what what I'm supposed to be doing and but once I I, I get familiar with it it's it's good I guess it, it's it's really I I like it and I can just go in there and do whatever reports I have to make but just learning that process it's been really um stressful at first you know but I'm I always feel really proud that I can do it I can get online and do what I have to do well, and you shared this morning too that you picked up the phone and called, right? Like uh -huh. that's that's just what we're talking about, right? right. Like, uh -huh. We don't know, and it's okay to reach out to those places that, mm -hmm. and just say, "I don't know," and right. what am I doing? Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know that was that was that was just a relief because I thought it was me that was doing that. I kept getting kicked out of the program, and I was going, "Ah, oh, what do I do?" And I remembered this lady's name was on on the grant and I called her and she said well I don't know let me um let me work on it for a while and then I'll get back to you so we're when I get done here I guess I'll go over and see what she's found out <laughs> but it's fun mm -hmm. and I think that <laughs> skill set I mean we need it in all aspects right mm -hmm. it's not just communicating to tech mm -hmm. and it's not just communicating to one another or interculturally it's mm -hmm. communicating across the board it's a skill set that you need to to get done the things that need to get done right um with where tech is heading how do you think the Cheyenne community would benefit from it regarding preservation of the culture and language etc well I know there's so much on on uh, the they you know like uh, events and stuff like that. They they put on Facebook, and they expect everybody to to know that this is happening. But so many of our our uh, people here in our country here, they don't have Facebook, or they don't they they don't have computers, or they don't have phones. So that's a challenge, you know what what to do. Because we we tell them, well, I was online. It was we we posted on Facebook. And then they say, well, I never. I don't know. I don't even know what Facebook is. <laughs> and even so for like recruitment mm -hmm. from the student services department, um, two of our biggest uh, recruitment efforts are um, a town crier that goes around and literally just blasts with a megaphone out of his truck that today's enrollment day, today's <laughs> sign up day, right. get over to the college and sign up. And then um, the uh, 
the bulletin boards like gas station, post office bulletin boards is still a place that people gather information. Mm -hmm. Um, But with regard to preservation of culture and language, um, I think there could be tremendous benefits as long as they mirror the preservation methodologies that already exist within the Cheyenne culture. Um, I'm always amazed at how far back the the Cheyenne oral history goes, even back to the fossil record. That means that the protocols and the determinations for access and the way things are transferred have already worked for a long, 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 long time. So we don't need to impose a Western sort of, I mean, I mean, it's so easy to do the Western way, right? It's how, it's what we're taught in the schools and it's so easy, but if we're going to appropriately preserve for the long haul, why not incorporate these beautiful traditions that have already held the knowledge, have already honored the knowledge, have already transmitted it. Um, so that's where I think that's my goal is to, and and it's going to take community involvement because as a non-native, I can't do that. I can't say what those protocols are. I can't police who has access because, because I don't know. And by not knowing it actually invites collaboration with the community. Um, It can be so intimidating. Yes, it is. If it is intimidating, (laughs) so intimidating, but you have a skill set that you're bringing to the table too, right? Like, um oh mine the comment in the in the chat is it can be so intimidating at first i'm fairly new to tech too yeah yeah it is it is intimidating and i think um for our especially for our our elders they 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 don't want to they don't even want to i have one lady that will not even have a phone because she don't want to learn to be usable so you know that that is and I'm with I her. I know. <laughs> Wish I could get rid of all of it. I know. Done with it. <laughs> Took me a while to 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 learn. Well, I don't even know my what I all have on my phone. I just know right. how to call and text. And, and that's, that's one like, of the challenges too, right? Is um, mm-hmm. how do we how do we market what we have? How do we mm-hmm. ensure that the the Cheyenne people that are craving this knowledge are able to find it, to engage with it, to navigate it. Um, and that's a whole other thing when it comes to the users um, is, is how do you, how do you not box this up and make, and, and make it only available to those that um, have technical skills, right? Yeah. Well, I guess we rely on the schools, you know, like, like right now, the, the younger grades too, they, the the little ones are so tech savvy, you know. So hopefully yeah. they can they can come to us after they learn all their, their skills. And that's just it too, right? Like mm-hmm. our the the children they're they're really our digital natives. They they've mm-hmm. grown up with uh a digital understanding that right. we will probably never have and they'll probably engage with our work down the road and be like what were these people thinking? <laughs> Why would they do it this way? They didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, we didn't know. Um, do you have any? Do you have any intergenerational programs that pair an elder with a younger, more tech familiar individual? That's kind of the class seven, kind of, kind of. I think when they're in the school system, they they learn, you know, how to to work with the because they they have a a program too where they have to record all their um, like their tests and. So the, the the class seven when we're saying class seven that was a program or a project initiated mm-hmm. um, I don't know ten fifteen years ago to. Right certify Cheyenne language speakers as Mm -hmm. teachers so that they could be in the classroom Mm -hmm. and educate from, from that, from, from a teaching 
place yeah. rather than just as a consultant. So they got class seven certification so they can be in the classroom. Yeah, they got the, a license actually from the state to teach. And it's been a real, um, I guess for them, it's been been really hard because just because they can speak Cheyenne doesn't mean they can teach. So that now what we're doing is we're really trying to help them with um, becoming teachers. And so that that's still that's where we we are now. We're we're we found out that just recently, I was going through how many teachers that we had, and found out that approximately maybe half need to renew their license. And now this year, the state is not going to accept any uh, paper renewal forms. So everything has to be online. And so that's one of the things that we have to, in our department, we need to get familiar with that process. And then we have to do a training for those people that have expired license because it's a requirement in the school that they have that license. So we're, so that's another thing that we have to learn Turn fast. You know, it's because we have to teach it now. That's well, and I when mean. you think of inclusive practices and, and building equity too, I, our elders hold so much knowledge. And I mean, just even that in itself is, um, I, I mean, I understand why the state's doing it. I understand why everybody's moving right. digital, but it does exclude some some knowledge bearers, some traditional knowledge bearers that that have a lot to give. Um. Okay. Um. Along those same lines, how do we build the bridge? How do we respect the folks who can't or don't want to use tech and still bring the benefits of tech to the community? Oh, yeah, just for consideration, I think that's really important to think about is, um, I, and again, that goes to the, um, I found, and I just keep putting this out there, I found a, a great partner in the um, public health field um, who we've approached some funding and stuff from the perspective that um, good health includes cultural expression and access to culture. So we found, so I'm just putting in that out there that um, if you're writing grants or you're trying to figure stuff out, there's, there might be people in the public health field that um, you could ally with. But um, that's one of, that was one of her things is that um, if you, if there isn't an engagement with tech, that does not diminish the need for people to be a part of the community um, to, to have good health. So um yeah, that's good good thoughts to have while you move forward. Um Yeah, oh, okay, there's a comment that says I imagine it's hard for people to enjoy technology if they're forced to adopt it. <laughs> uh, Same. <laughs> I feel that. Yeah, but I think once you can get into it it's um you know, it, it feels good once you can just master something like even just getting online and <laughs> little little steps. Yes. And for like, okay, so for seeking immortality, part of it is creating 3D renderings of um the artifacts that are at the cultural center. Mm -hmm. So I'm over there and I'm trying to do it and it's hard and it just doesn't make sense and it does in my head, but then when it's a flat object or a cylindrical object, like it's just not working, right? And mm -hmm. part of me is like, if I was 15, I would be so into this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when am I going to? And I guess it goes back to that vulnerability thing. Um, when am I going to have enough confidence in this practice in order to feel good about doing it? I don't have that confidence yet. Right. Mm -hmm. And that confidence only comes from continually engaging with that technology. Right. And I'm not, I'm not getting anything to work, right. but I will. Patience. Will. Patience. Thank somebody you, with patience. No, go That's, ahead. Yes. It's okay. <laughs> Yell that to me when I'm over there in the corner right. trying to do it. Take a deep breath. <laughs> yes, true. Um, a comment says mastering a tech task is so rewarding, and I can't wait to get there. And I'll I'll share this too. Um, I was thinking about this this morning when I was thinking about not knowing or 
being vulnerable and stuff. My daughter does dance and um, she's in like a little dance troupe. We go compete and stuff, but she was doing something else and I could tell she was nervous. So I said to her, are you nervous? You know, do you, do you need a break? Do you, do you need to step out? And she goes, mom, it's so good after this. She's like, I learned that from dance that whenever I'm scared on the other side of it is something that's really fun. So to speaking to vulnerability and to being scared and trying to master things, um, it's okay because on the other side of it, even though we're in the hard stuff on this side, on the other side is really good feelings. <laughs> All the feelings, really good stuff. Um, are there any more questions? Mine is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, no, I did. I don't. Okay. There's so much, you know, that we that we do and but it, but we have such a need for better like um um ways that we can we can um um what am I trying to say? Make our inventory better, more accessible, and that's where I've been. I've been. I was asked to tell people what if what could I do? How could I make this more so people can access this instead of just telling them where it is? You know, hey, should you ever read that book? This has that information. You know, <laughs> instead of I don't know. I guess I guess just having a better idea of how something should be done how we, we can do it better on, you know, using technology because I'm not all, I'm not a tech person. And, and like Adrian was saying earlier, I'm out. Sometimes I'm even afraid to ask the, the tech people because they say, well, what is it? What is it doing? I don't know. I don't know. But this is what I did. You know, it's just so just having a, I guess. You have even projected job. onto them that, that they're unfriendly and that they mm -hmm. won't help me when really it's probably more right that, that I'm scared or that I don't want to. Yeah. Don't want to make that moment. Ourselves. Right. Yeah. When we make ourselves look real stupid. <laughs> so we don't, we're afraid to ask. Um, there's another question. Is there a process you would like people to use if they would like to help from outside the Cheyenne communities? Um, let us know. It might fit in somewhere. Right. What can you what can you do to help? What you got? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we might need that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that too. Okay. I'll ask some more questions. Uh, so I, I, first off, thank you guys. This is wonderful. And, and this is so just, it's, I, it's also nice to know I'm not the only one who sits there staring at, you know, a metadata sheet going, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, but I was wondering if you guys could reflect a little bit on, cause you know, I, I, I've definitely heard a lot of talking about like accessibility and all of that. Um, what would a better process look like? What would it look like if, you know, those of us who are, you know, not power users, like how would we really talk about accessibility? Like, because, you know, like you said, Adrian, you know, you sometimes are projecting uh, on the IT guys that, you know, they're unfriendly and I'm sure that they feel frustrated that we don't speak their language. So how do we, how do we make that process look better? Like if we could like redesign the whole world from, you know, on high and instead of the, the being, cause I always kind of compare like tech almost to like the Latin Bible, right? Because there's the laity and we aren't supposed to know anything or say anything. And then there's like the inside circle. So how do we make it vulgar as it were? Yeah, I think, um, I think, Going back to that, um, that it's okay not to know and speaking to not knowing, you create a conversational field in where, in which everybody understands what page we're on and what language we should be speaking. Um, when, when you engage with a, uh, someone who doesn't speak your own, um, language, 
we say, I, I just went to Italy. I, uh, very little. I know a little, you know, and, and we, we put that out there that this is where I'm coming from and how I hope to communicate. And I think just even putting that at the forefront of conversations um, is important, especially interdepartmentally. And then also um, just recognizing, um, I think I think some imposter syndrome stuff comes into this, but recognizing that we're advocating for our departments. Um, we're not stupid because we don't speak those other languages, um, but we, we do speak our field, you know, and we do have um, uh, things that we need to get done in our own departments. And it involves being able to marry those and, and, and integrate with other departments. And speaking to access, how would it look if it was dreamy? I think it would look like a card catalog. <laughs> There'd be a Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> would your dream be a card catalog, Mina? I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm trying to think of, of how I was thinking of maybe um a book. I mean, not a book, but a page, you know, where you're putting down what you want to convey, you know, just showing pictures or something. Yeah. Or a story, you know. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's also a completely different way from the way that, you know, we organize information in the Western world. But, you know, one of the nice things I think about the new affordances of all this tech is we can imagine new ways to access, right? Mm -hmm. I was just going to say something along the lines of what Mina just said, and that's, um, I mean, uh, in line with uh, being respectful of uh, what the Cheyenne communities want to have happen and always asking and always listening. Um, there's also a way of looking at just the entire language of, of computing. If you're coming, if you're coming from the outside or me as a senior, you know, I'm not a tech person. And I know, like what you just said, Bina, if it's written down step by step and with visuals, it's, and maybe even something you hold in your hand, it's a wonderful um, tool to sort of get your toe in the door of, of tech. And, and to that end, Penn, um, we, with the Seeking Immortality, part of this, um, the goal is to have a toolkit that other tribes can use to create their own virtual spaces, to digitize their own artifacts. And what I've found even in the past year and a half working on this project is that in order for community members to be able to continue to engage with their cultural objects, there has to be something that can be handed off like a, like a sheet, you know, just this is the app that you're gonna push. This mm -hmm. is how you push play. This mm -hmm. is how you save it because um, a, a collection that we've been working with recently has a lot of, um, let's say, uh, as an example, um, gender protocols around who can access, who can listen. Um, as, a, as a female, I can't. So how do I... And, and it and it, it at first I mean my mind at first it's a barrier right if I can't do it who can well no actually it's an open door because now um, members of the community will be engaging with their culture by being the ones to push record by being the ones to catalog that stuff so it becomes an invitation in rather than a barrier um, to to uh, to access or to getting it done or whatever you know it becomes a way for. Um, so yeah, with, my point is that with the Seeking Immortality, with a toolkit, how do we make this as boiled down and simple as possible? And it turns out that I am the perfect <laughs> guinea pig for our cheat sheets. <laughs> if I can implement them, <laughs> then we'll probably be able to have other people implement them. But really, those cheat sheets become a way to connect people to technology and connect them to their cultural culture i was told once if you can't explain it to a child you don't actually understand it yeah but there's also i mean yes but there's also a point too where we understand things so much that we can't boil it down anymore um we had a reporter come to do a, a story for native sun news on the 
seeking a mortality project. And she said, I need you to explain this as bare bones as possible. And I'm like, well, it's a virtual reality experience in which people can engage with their culture. And she's like, nope, try again. And it's like, I don't know how to make it easier. <laughs> so like, even I, I just reflected on that moment and my understanding has even gone past being able to, which means I probably don't understand it well enough to boil it down. But there is that, um, that point where it, it flips and the way that you understand it um, evolves past being able to, um, I don't know. You can't explain it without some of the terms, right? Once you know the terms and you know those definitions, it's hard to go back to explain it. I guess maybe if I use my hands more, it's a virtual space and you wear these things. Yeah. <laughs> touch things. <laughs> And that's, that's how the Cheyenne used that They had this uh, sign language where they would, you know, they understood that. Most of the Plains, that Plains tribes, they understood the sign language. So that's how they would talk. And so we're, that's one of the things that we've been encouraging our people is to learn the sign language, you know. And so it, it's, it's, it's fun, you know, just to, for us to, I mean, we don't, I don't know. I know a little bit, you know, I know how to say, tell when somebody's talking you now. Or they'll say, how is it now? I'll go like this. Good. <laughs> so a little stuff like that I can I can do. And so I think that's maybe. And that's part of the fun part about uh, kind of shifting language preservation and thinking about it in a, a virtual sense is that now it's not just an audio recording. We're also um, preserving those little parts of the language that are embodied in, in are embodied are, are part of our physical expressions. Um, there's very distinct things in the Cheyenne language that mm-hmm. are done with faces and, and stuff that over yeah. there. And that's what one of the elders told us. He said, when you're telling a story in Cheyenne, especially to our youth, use sign language because, you know, you can, you can get your point across to them. And so that's something that the college has has a class that they they offer Cheyenne like um uh, sign language I, I just wanted to say one more thing I'm just so impressed with um um the uh the depth of respect and and the history and uh just all the efforts that uh you both and your and the community of the Cheyenne communities are putting into um, preserving an incredible bank of knowledge. So I just wanted to say how much I appreciate what, what you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say again, I really appreciate you both taking the time, sharing your experience and wisdom. Um, part of our goal with the circle project is to encourage, you know, English majors, you know, like I was, and, you know, students who don't think of themselves as tech people to understand that they're still people with power in this world and um, to use their voices if tech is being used for good or for ill to, to try to make things a little bit better. And so you guys are both people who do tremendous things to make the world a lot better. And so we really appreciate you both sharing your time and expertise. We have time for maybe one more question, if anyone has one that, that's burning on your hearts. Nope. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you again for joining us. And we'll see everyone on May 7th for our uh, final talk of the year. Thank you again. All right. Okay. Thanks. Bye, everybody.